we find ourselves more likely to believe that we have value and worth as a person. Sociologists often use the love of a parent for their child to demonstrate the impact that unconditional love has on a person's self-worth. So gaining an understanding of how God thinks and feels about you is very important to your own understanding of yourself and the value of your relationship with God. Reading Genesis gives us a clue as to what God was thinking when he created us. But it's not perfect. There's a lot more left unsaid in Genesis than is actually said. Words can paint a picture of an early morning sunrise, but unless you actually experience a sunrise for yourself, then you'll never truly understand what the author was talking about. We need to experience God's love for ourselves. Throughout our series, we have two aims. One, to teach you what the Bible says uh, about God and his intention and heart towards you. And two, for you to actually experience God's love for you in a deeply personal way. Genesis 1. Verses 26 to 28. Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry. Who uses the word scurry? Yeah, that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Created in God's image. Have you ever created someone in your own image? If you have children, or you're the child of someone, then you know what I'm talking about. Biologically, all of us have been created in the image of our parents. We've inherited genetic traits directly from them. Animals weren't created in the image of God, even though he created them. Plants weren't created in the image of God, even though he created them. Only humans, men and women, were created in the image of God. To be created in the image of God means that you're a child of God in the truest sense. He is the great ancestor of the human race. You have a direct relational link to him. Now this family connection is why Jesus in Luke chapter 11 drew the comparison between earthly fathers and God when he said, which of you fathers, if your son asked for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asked for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Being created in the image of God means that our future potential is endless. It's eternal. Solomon hinted at it in Ecclesiastes when he said in chapter 3, verse 11, he has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. Well, we're a little bit more advanced than Solomon and we're trying to actually give you a bit of a broad picture of God's work on the planet from the beginning to the end over this series. When God created Adam and Eve, he didn't create them as the top dogs in the animal kingdom. He didn't create them as the janitors responsible for keeping the earth tidy. He created them in his own image as members of his family, a privilege that not even the angels enjoy. He built a beautiful garden for them and he let them live there. They had free run of the place. And the only thing that he told them that they couldn't do was eat from eat the fruit from a particular tree. Everything was going well, but then decay and death entered paradise. Genesis 3. Verses 1 to 13. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? 
The woman said to the servant, we may eat fruit from all the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it. She added a little bit, or you will die. You will not certainly die, the servant said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who had been standing there quietly watching everything unfold, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Adam and Eve were then expelled from the garden at that point, and their idyllic life started to unravel because they picked up a hitchhiker. They were never meant to. Sin had entered into their lives and had started to fracture their relationship with God. Remember last week when I launched our series, if you were here, I shared a scripture from the words of Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verse 8. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. And the Passion Translation puts it like this. What bliss you experience when your heart is full of innocence, for then your eyes will open to see more and more of God. Adam and Eve traded in their innocence for a lie. Blinded by their selfishness and pride, and the human race have reaped the consequences of their actions ever since. Not only have we reaped the consequences of their actions, but we've added our own to it. All of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of God's perfect love. And here we have a perfect world shattered by one act of pride and selfishness. Now, very few of us today can even begin to comprehend why it was so shocking. Because we're so conditioned by the world that we live in. We live in a fallen world that's full of sin, hatred, evil and wickedness. Adam and Eve entered a world that was perfect, where the law of love rules supreme and they broke it. Why do you think the Bible says God hates pride? It's because pride devastated his family before it even had a chance to get out of the starting box. But even in the midst of a monumental calamity, a calamity that the world is still suffering from, there's something happening here in Genesis that we often miss. God doesn't disappear off the scene after Adam and Eve's sin. Adam and Eve are no longer in the garden. However, God continues to interact with them. All throughout Genesis, we see and we hear from God. He speaks to Cain right before and after Cain had murdered his brother Abel. The descendants of Adam knew about God and some pursued a relationship with him. Enoch, one of the great-great-grandsons of Adam and the great-grandfather of Noah, had such a good relationship with God that God decided to take him out of the world. Genesis 5, 21 to 23. When Enoch was 65 years old, he became the father of Methuselah. I hope that doesn't happen to me. After the birth of Methuselah, Methuselah, Enoch lived in close fellowship with God for another 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Enoch lived 365 years, walking in close fellowship with God. Then one day he disappeared because God took him. The sad thing, though, was that even though God was still with them, humanity started to move further and further away from a relationship with him until everyone other than Noah had completely abandoned him. Genesis 6, verse 5 to 9, The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. 
And the Lord said, I will wipe this human race I've created from the face of the earth. Yes, I will destroy every living thing, all the people, the large animals, the small animals that scurry along the ground, and even the birds of the sky. I am sorry I ever made them. But Noah found favor with the Lord. Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless person living on earth at the time, and he walked in close fellowship with God. You know, people often ask why one sin was so devastating. What's so bad about one sin? Well, the answer to that question is seen in what happened to the human race after that first sin in the garden. One sin always leads to another and another and another. Without some way of removing the root of sin, the end result is always death and decay. Genesis 2, verse 16 and 17. This is what God had said to Adam before Adam had eaten of that tree. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Now God didn't have an antidote for sin sitting in his cupboard for when Adam and Eve ate the fruit from the tree. He knew it would kill them, which is why he warned them not to eat it. Preparing a cure for sin would take another 4,000 years before it was ready. And the cost was staggering. But that's a story for another day. Here's a thought that might help you um, wrap your head around what happened here and why there was a tree that could cause untold heartache for all of humanity sitting out in the open. As I said, Genesis doesn't say a great deal. And sometimes I wish we could have got video of what happened and filled in all the blanks. doesn't say a great deal. But what it does say gives us some clues as to what was actually going on. The Garden of Eden, just so you, you understand, the Garden of Eden was God's home on earth. It wasn't the only place on the planet that had animals and plants. But it was the place that God had set aside for his family to live in and to catch up with each other each day. Every day, God would meet with Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening. He had given them the complete run of his house because they were family. Within God's home... We know of two treasures that he collected. There may have been more. He said to them not to eat the fruit from one of them because it, could, it would kill them, just like any concerned parent would do. Now, I'm, I'm sure that you've all told, told your kids at certain times to avoid uh, certain things in your home. Now, we don't know what restrictions were placed around the trees all we know is that they didn't listen to their father and they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, before you think that Adam and Eve were naive, they were innocent. But they were, I think, incredibly intelligent. Why is that? Why do I think that Adam and Eve were incredibly intelligent? Because every genius that's ever walked the face of the earth comes from their genetic stock. See, we oftentimes think, when we look back over history, and we think that because we have the internet today, and we've got Google, and we drive cars, and we fly in planes in the air, that somehow we are smarter than our ancestors. But nothing can be further than the truth. Um, do any of you here today know how to make an aeroplane? No. Nah. Do any of you here, would you know how to hook up the internet throughout a community? I'm hoping. Can you do that, Mark? <laughs> but there are so many things in our world today that we just take for granted, and we think that proves that we are smarter than the past, but we would have no clue as to how to put it together. Don't ever think that Adam and Eve were children. Naive children who didn't know what they were doing. They were incredibly intelligent, 
They were perfect in every single way. They had absolutely no hang-ups and they still chose willfully to disobey God. So it wasn't an accident. And we don't know uh, how God had set those trees up. We just we read the story. The story is pretty light on with the details. But, it, but there's a tree in the garden. And God says, don't eat from that tree. Now, we don't know if there, were, if there were barriers around. We don't know what they had to hack through to get to that tree. But they got to the tree and they ate from it. And today we are still suffering from the introduction of sin into our family line. Adam and Eve didn't die immediately, but the taint of decay and death that entered their bodies because of their sin, started a process that continues to this day in every one of the descendants. Because just as they were originally created in the image of God, they too passed down their image to everyone who came after them. An image that had been poisoned at a fundamental level by the sin that they had invited in. Now I call this time period in the history of humanity the epoch of cause and effect. It covers the time from Adam through Noah up and up until the time of Moses when the sacrifice of the temple was put into place. It's here that we see the outworkings of sin and the impact of sin on a perfect and pristine world where there was no intervention by God, where the natural laws that were in place played out. Without God directly intervening, humanity was powerless to turn around their slide into evil. And it wasn't God's fault. This was the consequences of their own actions, the actions that Adam and Eve's descendants chose to continue in. Now the fact that Noah was considered a righteous man shows that their free will hadn't been taken from them because one man was still able to live righteously. But also that free will in and of itself wasn't enough to deal with the effect of sin, the impact of selfishness and pride on the human race. Without an intervention, humanity was one generation away from extinction. If Noah had died before the flood, then there would have been no ark. The only way at that time to remove sin from the earth was through the death of those who were carrying it. Interesting point of hope here for parents. It doesn't say that Noah's sons or their wives were righteous. It just says that Noah. Now, I'm including his wife there because the Bible says that the two became one flesh, all right? His wife was righteous, obviously. Otherwise, Noah wouldn't have been righteous. Obviously. <laughs> that's, that's the way it was but no, it doesn't say that Noah's kids his sons and his sons were adults at this time they had wives and they had children of their own it doesn't say that Noah's sons were righteous but Noah's sons were saved because of the righteousness of their father and I just want to encourage parents maybe you've got some crazy kids at the moment that are doing things you wish they weren't you just keep on loving Jesus keep on serving Jesus keep on following Jesus Keep on doing the right thing because your righteousness has an impact on their future. Don't ever forget it. If it worked back then, it's working right now. So what can we learn from Genesis? Six real quick things. This is what we can learn from Genesis and then we're going to wrap. First one, we are created in his image, which means we're family. You are related to God. You're created in His image. God is the great ancestor of the human race. Number two, God initiated a relationship with us. Therefore, we can trust in His commitment to seeing it flourish. This is God's idea, not our idea. He's our parent, the ultimate parent of every single man, woman, boy, and girl who walks on this planet. God is their ancestor. He started it all off. He is absolutely committed to seeing our relationship flourish. You know, the funny thing about parents is they put up with a lot of stuff from their kids, don't they? 
Well, I hear some stories sometimes that other parents tell me about their kids, and I just want to kill them for them. You know what I mean? And then I think, well, I put up with way more work <laughs> from my own children. And Jesus made the connection between us as fathers and our Heavenly Father in Luke 11. He said, if you who are evil, you who are tainted by sin, know how to look after your own kids, how much more will your Heavenly Father look after you? God started this relationship. He is absolutely committed wholeheartedly to this relationship. If we think we understand what it's like as parents to love our kids, we have no idea when compared with God's love for humanity. So we can come away from Genesis knowing that God is 100% committed to this relationship, to this family relationship. Point number three, sin is real and it drives us away from God. And it doesn't matter how small it is. We like to justify our own sin. When I was a Catholic, they taught us that there were two types of sin, venial sins and mortal sins. Venial sins were the little white lies that we tell. Mortal sins were the ones that would send you to hell. Well, actually, there is no such thing in the Bible. The Bible says sin is sin. I ate a piece of fruit. Disobeyed God. Placed my own pride, my own selfishness ahead of somebody else's. Uh, pride and selfishness, no. <laughs> but at least my own, my own uh, what I wanted, ahead of someone else. And sin entered into the heart of all of humanity. It was only a small sin. But that small sin breeds bigger sins. And it leads to death and decay. So don't think that, oh, you know, I'm not as bad as that person three rows down from me. Everybody's counting three rows down there. I'm not as bad as that person three rows. Don't think that your sin is, is, is less than somebody else's. Sin is bad. Full stop. And it drives us away from God. It creates a barrier between us and God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. If you're struggling to see God, don't blame it on society. Don't blame it on lack of teaching. Don't blame it on your upbringing. Examine your heart, first and foremostly. Examine what's going on inside your heart. Check, check all of the attitudes that you have towards others. If there is offence in there, deal with it. If there's unforgiveness in your life, deal with it. If there are things that you're doing that you shouldn't be doing, stop doing them and ask God to forgive you. Deal with yourself first. Because it's what goes on on the inside of us that is far, far more important to our eternal well-being than what's happening around us. But what we do is we use that as an excuse for drifting away from God. It is not easy in our day and age to continue walking after God. There are a lot of loud voices out there that are doing everything that they can to tell us that God is real, just as it was back in the time of Noah. And it's interesting, Jesus said that before he returns, it will be just the same as it was in the time of Noah. People, people will be still giving each other in marriage. There will be stuff still happening. And he says, and, he, and Jesus said, and then Noah and his family entered the ark. They closed the ark up and the rains came. He said, exactly, that will be exactly what it is like when Jesus returns. So regardless of what's going on around you outside, guard your heart. Sin is real. It will drive you away from God doesn't matter how small it is. Number four, there is an enemy who seeks to separate us from God. In, the, in Genesis chapter 2, we have the, or chapter 3, we have the, the, the appearance of Satan for the very first time in the Bible. And what did he do? He told some lies. He, he, he mixed some truth with lies. And he got Adam and Eve. He tempted Adam and Eve to do something that then absolutely shattered uh, paradise. Now, he didn't force them to do it. The devil can't make you do it. He was the devil made you do it. No, the devil can't make you do anything. The devil can tempt you to do something, but he can't make you do something. You choose to do it yourself. 
But he's there. There is an enemy who is seeking to separate us from God. Five, even when we sin, God remains close. I think that's one of the most encouraging things about Genesis when you read it. They get kicked out of the garden and God is still there. God is still with them. People were still calling on the name of the Lord. People were still in fellowship with him. Over time, they continued, sin continued to, to do its, its, its horrible work in people's lives and they ended up drifting away. And there were a couple of other things that happened during that time that we don't have time to go into this morning. But God was there every step of the way. And then even when it got incredibly bad, here's Noah, a righteous man who walked closely in fellowship with God. I find that really encouraging. I find the fact that um, my sin isn't enough to drive God away. God will still be there and I can still uh, find him. And then finally, the state of our heart determines the closeness of our relationship. If I could use those back, that'd be great. The state of our heart determines the closeness of our relationship. Obviously, Moses, oh, sorry, Noah made a choice to walk with God. Enoch made a choice to walk with God. Abel, before he was murdered by his brother Cain, made a choice to walk with God on the other side of the fall. Now, we live on the other side of Jesus, which means we are in a far, far better place. We actually have the tools at, at, at hand to deal with sin in our lives. They didn't have that back then. But we still are faced with a choice. We still are faced with a choice of whether we're going to sin each day. When things happen, when people disappoint us, do we keep that attitude in our hearts against them? Or do we bring it before God and ask Him to forgive us? Do we release them through forgiveness of what they have done toward us? Remember in the first week, I was it my first? No, it was during the series on forgiveness where we looked at what Jesus said about forgiveness. He said, if you don't forgive people their sin, then your Heavenly Father won't forgive you your sin. But are you dealing with your heart? If you want to see God, you want to know God, to walk closely with God, then you have to deal with your heart on a daily basis. It's my prayer, it's my hope that over this series, that a that there would that there would come into all of our hearts a determination to deal with whatever happens in our hearts that would push us away from God. So when you're getting cranky with someone, you deal with that because you don't want that to come between you and you finding God in your world and you seeing God and you having a relationship with God. Or there might be something that you're tempted to do when nobody's looking, but you'll come back to, no, actually, it is more important to me to know God than to indulge in this sin over here. Even though nobody else will know, it will still impact my relationship. It will still make it so much harder for me to see God in my world and to walk closely with God. It's a day by day proposition. Sin destroyed the, hu the, 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 the sin destroyed the human race. God didn't have a cure ready. It took four thousand years, and then Jesus came. And the price He paid was His life, because that was the price of sin. The only way to get rid of sin was you had to kill the carrier of sin. And the Bible tells us that Jesus took our sin upon himself on the cross. All sin of all humankind took it upon himself and then he died in our place. It's an incredible story actually when you look at it. And we're going to be digging into that more. But I don't want anybody to leave here. Maybe this morning you haven't um, realised just how bad a predicament you're actually in. And you haven't realized that Jesus has made a way out of it. And I want you to go home and think, well, I've got to wait till the end of the year before we get to Jesus in the Bible. And I discover the way out of the predicament that our forefathers placed us in. But it's through your faith and trust in Jesus that you're able to have your sin dealt with.
So let's just close our eyes this morning.